Thank you, Dr. Caspi. It is now my pleasure to introduce our second speaker, a physician from Texas who so impressed students in your class with a in this ceremony. He is Dr. Alan Blum, Assistant Professor and Coordinator of Patient Education and Health Promotion at Baylor College of Medicine. A graduate of Amherst College who earned his MD from Emory University School of Medicine. Dr. Blum was the founder and is chairman of an organization called DOC, which stands for Doctors Ought to Care. DOC is a national nonprofit organization of health professionals developing new approaches for health promotion through the mass media. Dr. Blum's own skills as a communicator have earned him numerous awards, including Health Educator of the Year in 1986 from the New York State Federation of Professional Health Educators. I am pleased to present Dr. Alan Blum. President Lamb, members of the board, Dean Perper, members of the faculty, honored guests, and uh, delightfully talented students. As I look around, I see proud parents who can now say, to borrow a phrase, my son or daughter, the doctor. And I see smiling grandparents of physicians who will now take care of you and not send you a bill. I see the spouses and the children, how very much these graduates owe to you and to their respective financial institutions. Finally, I see the budding doctors themselves, how many years you've slaved to reach this day. Now you know you were never doing as badly as your paranoia made it seem. I'm honored to have been asked to speak today on this important occasion, all the more so since I don't suppose you've had too many commencement speakers who've been turned down for admission as a student here. And, and later as a faculty member. And who's a family doctor who's never received who's never received a, f a major research grant, who doesn't have tenure, to address this renowned research institution. My contribution to this College of Medicine has been to serve first as a guest lecturer at the Social Medicine Residency Program, then as an invited speaker in each of the past five years in the second year course on cancer created by Professor Robert Basis. The kind of message I've tried to offer each medical student is that even as students, and most assuredly as physicians, you can have a real impact on the prevention of disease both in what you do in the office, clinic, or hospital, as in well, what you choose to play in the community at large. I'm especially interested in the origins of the health beliefs and knowledge of our patients and their families. In effect, I'm really here today because of work I began as a medical student more than 15 years ago when I developed a model project for greater student and physician involvement in community-wide disease prevention to counteract the promotion of unhealthy products. At first, we developed a presentation for school kids and medical colleagues alike that included photographs of horrific tobacco-caused and alcohol-caused diseases, juxtaposed to advertisements from Sports Illustrated, Time, Newsweek, and the New York Times touting the benefits of alcohol and cigarettes. This talk and thousands of them since then have been developed into others on nutrition, sexuality, drug abuse, and we have over 119 chapters in medical schools and residencies throughout the country. Our slogan is laughing the pushers out of town. We use humor. We work with children, and we pay for advertising space in local communities to counteract the drug pushing that goes on. We've created the Emphysema Slims Tennis Tournament with Martina No Smoke Nova and the Barf Burl Man to laugh as we would at the tobacco industry. It helps to remember that when we started out in the early 1970s, or nearly a decade after the issuance of the first Surgeon General's report on smoking, Federal, state, local, and medical school efforts to end the epidemic of tobacco-caused diseases were virtually non-existent. Oh, various health organizations were producing cute and clever public service ads. You know public service announcements. They're the ads on at 3 in the morning telling kids not to take rides with strangers when the only people up that time of night listening are the strangers. Then there was the National Cancer Institute, which incredibly, through the early 1980s, devoted its entire lung cancer prevention budget to finding a safer cigarette. The inspiration to become involved in the smoking issue came not from a medical school or a scientific journal, but years before, from my father, a general practitioner in the Rockaways, just a summer's subway ride away from here. 
It was he who in the 1950s had suggested I tape record all those delightful TV and radio jingles that promised Winston tastes good like a cigarette should and happiness is Kent. If you've been a Yankee fan over the years, you may have followed the endorsements of Lou Gehrig and Joe DiMaggio and Mickey Mantle and Smoke Camels. Dodger fans puffed Lucky Strike and habitues of the polar grounds sang their ABCs always by Chesterfield. Let's not forget little Johnny for Philip Morris, and nobody ever asked what stunted his growth. But the important thing is that one day, my father predicted society will look back on our era of undeniably marvelous scientific advances and sadly remark at a nation that looked the other way while advertisers continue to devise even more ingenious propaganda for an irredeemably harmful product that in effect undermines much of the product, the progress the medical profession has made. My father was the kind of physician Dr. Caspi was talking about. He loved the practice of medicine, from the 7 a.m. hospital rounds to the 11 p.m. house calls. His office was in our home, where every afternoon the living room became the waiting room. His favorite day was Monday, when he could start the week anew seeing patients in the very community in which he'd been raised. Like Sam Abelman in The Last Angry Man, there was always a patient to treat after hours and always an article in JAMA to catch up on before bedtime. In short, he was the kind of person that each of us who has chosen a medical career likes to think made all the difference. But it was not his knowledge, his clinical acumen, his compassion, or even his love of medicine that most impressed me. Rather, it was his understanding of the importance of communicating in a straightforward and non-technical way, of avoiding medical jargon, of making sure he was understood, and of not overlooking the obvious or believing anything was too easy or too difficult. The importance of asking questions and listening closely, of constantly trying to place the patient in a comprehensible context. Where are you from? What do you do? What do you enjoy doing? The kind of small talk that genuinely said he cared. Importantly, he never lost sight of the real need for health education beyond the examining room. He was a true environmentalist, learning the nuances of the neighborhoods near the office, picking up a bit of Spanish when the population changed, stopping to talk with a hospital handyman, a high school teacher, a priest, a police sergeant. He felt that true health promotion required a visible presence on the part of health professionals in, out in the community, in the streets prevention, in the streets education of the public at large, to reinforce the in the office teaching of patients one-on-one. -on -one. So it was in this context that he pointed out to me, a high school editor in 1964, that the solution to the tobacco epidemic was one of prevention and reaching children and adolescents. Well, where have we come? The more things change, the more they remain the same. Survival from lung cancer today is little better than it was 30 years ago. What are medical schools doing to combat the tobacco problem today? Apart from the occasional lectures such as Dr. Basis arranges, I know of not a single course in any medical school that explores the multifarious aspects of this problem which has been named time and time again by the Surgeon General, the World Health Organization, and every major health body, the single most preventable cause of death and disease. As devastating as AIDS has been in the time that 35,000 lives have been lost to it since 1980, more than 3.2 million Americans have died due to tobacco-caused diseases. Our failure to study and understand, understand an evil such as the tobacco industry, which is largely headquartered not in North Carolina and Virginia, but in New York City, has led us to see nothing wrong with applying for research grants from Philip Morris or RJR Nabisco or the New York City-based Council for Tobacco Research, and even to invest in tobacco stocks for our endowment or pension plans. I mention this with full regard for this occasion because I wouldn't be true to my cause any other way, because it's an issue that has been ignored and even ridiculed by medical schools long enough, because it's an issue that impinges on each of the specialties the graduates have chosen, and because there is much that each person here today can do to end the tobacco pandemic. Indeed, if our jobs in healthcare or the very future of funding for this medical center depended on there being a decline in consumption of tobacco, alcohol, or drugs, I think we would be doing far more to challenge the influence of the legal pushers in our midst. It all begins, that is, health education, health promotion, with the listening to the individual victims of these preventable diseases and not blaming them for their condition. Health promotion begins with a one-on-one -on -one patient education, learning a lot about a, from a lot of patients. If we couldn't graduate from medical school until our patients were tested on how well they understood, what it was we were trying to tell them, and how well they could follow that and repeat to us, then I'm not so certain we'd be sitting here, we'd be out working harder to make sure that they understood. 
but within the medical profession, incentives for health promotion are not strong. Why should the responsibility or onus of health promotion fall to the overworked physician in the first place? Aren't we trained in advanced techniques of diagnosis, treatment, and research? Certainly, health promotion would not seem the best investment for time, money, or intellect. Besides, what third-party payer reimburses for knowledge imparted? In a technological era, how will the patient expecting at the very least a prescription or a procedure respond to valuable time given over to just talk? And what could the physician really be expected to say that the patient hasn't heard a million times before? The catch is that patient education is not a separate part of the physician-patient encounter or the giving of a pamphlet poster or a little preaching on the way out the door. Rather, it is part and parcel of everything we do. Every syllable, every gesture, every facial expression communicates a message to the patient and permits us to receive feedback from the patient in return. When you say to the patient, your tests are negative, bear in mind that to some people, negative is not a very positive word. I remember the patient who was extremely distraught over her condition. What was it? Nonspecific. Don't worry, the cardiologist had told her, it's only nonspecific. But to her, the disease of nonspecific sounded pretty scary. When I suggested to a patient that she take an antibiotic for her sinus infection, she angrily told the nurse, I can't get these capsules up my nose. Don't be certain that your patient whom you inform has hypertension doesn't think that means just too much tension. Or the woman I asked if she'd been through menopause replying, no, but I've seen Mammoth Cave. Then there was a letter to the editor I, I saw not too long ago. What's all this fuss I hear about cat's canners being put in at the hospital? If I wanted to can a cat, I certainly wouldn't want to do it in a hospital of all places. What do you want to can a cat for anyway? That's one of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard of to do to a poor cat. I don't want any of my tax dollars used on cat abuse. If I hear one word about cats screaming to death and being stuffed into cans at the hospital, I'll be the first to call the SPCA. Ideally, health education derives from a core content of well-rehearsed and up-to-date information, individualized and personalized to the patient like any dose of medication. It's that way that physicians can expand their health promotion efforts onto the community at large. Such activity can in help, turn help create a climate of support for the physician's efforts in the office setting. At its most advanced level, health promotion aims for the entire community, not just for those at risk for various illnesses. Health promotion messages aimed at everyone will reach and may help those at risk, but will also help reinforce the positive value system of those not at risk. But it is folly to believe that reversing adverse lifestyles can be achieved through the efforts of physicians alone. That would be akin to expecting the nation's drug abuse problem to be solved solely by the police and FBI, or the many problems plaguing schools to be actively solved solely by teachers and principals. The major myth of health promotion is that everyone favors it, like motherhood and apple pie. In fact, there are both soft-spoken and vociferous opponents of health promotion throughout society. If it's safe, non-threatening, the public will pay it lip service. Brush your teeth after meals, drink your milk, eat your spinach. A more ominous side to health promotion emerges when one considers that sector whose profit and self-interest depend on the encouragement of risk-taking, health-demoting behavior. A society that truly adopts good health practices will adversely affect the profits of the pharmaceutical industry, the tobacco industry, distillers, automobile manufacturers, insurance and hospital corporations, the news media through the loss of advertising revenue, and of course, the advertising business itself. In essence, these forces have become our leading health educators, promising light beer, low tar smokes, little round yellow pills, and zero to 60 in 1.2 seconds. And while we're perceived in our offices and medical centers as finger-wagging do-gooders, Newport, alive with pleasure, glows over the Bronx, and the Marlboro Man rides herd over all the kids who visit Yankee Stadium seeking a hero. And just across the street right here, the Merritt crush-proof box sits there, looming over this school. Physician needs to perceive themselves not just as, much as just as much victims of advertising as their patients, not only in terms of consumer goods, but also pharmaceutical products. How ironic that while our manuscripts undergo the most rigorous scrutiny by the medical journals to which we submit them, the pharmaceutical advertisements escape peer review. As the leading sponsors of continuing medical education, drug companies and equipment manufacturers skew our priorities and our very orientation toward pharmacotherapy and technological solutions. That free pen light or pizza you accept isn't free at all. It's our patients who get stuck with a bill. This is particularly insidious since physicians come to be regarded not as teachers, but as prescribers. Eventually, as with the alcohol and tobacco pushers, we become complacent about pharmaceutical advertising and believe there's nothing we can do about it, so why bother? 
but by taking an unabashedly activist role in health promotion, the physician can delight in being a teacher, exemplar, patient advocate, instead of some semi-divine miracle worker. Miracles have nothing to do with health promotion. What health promotion requires is time, enthusiasm, and faith in other people and in oneself. Sadly, it also involves an awareness of the fact that strong vested interests are working to resist any change in the status quo over which they do not have prior approval. A principal motivating emotion of anyone truly interested in getting involved in health promotion is anger. Seeing how preventable premature illness is being actively promoted in our society, even to our own children in our own neighborhoods, one would do well to respond not unlike the television commentator in the film network, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. One must bear in mind that many major health problems are also social problems that demand a concerted effort by a broad coalition. Similarly, many social problems such as racism, illiteracy, homelessness, and juvenile crime need to be better addressed by all health professionals. Unless we begin to modify our miracle cure mentality in medical centers toward one of health promotion and disease prevention, our healthcare system most assuredly becomes for all its technological marvels, a tower of Babel, confusing and ultimately ineffective. To the medical graduates today, I urge you to maintain that marvelous sense of humor and camaraderie I saw last night. I hope you will try hard not to become so compartmentalized or absorbed in your specialty that you are unable or embarrassed to communicate with colleagues in different fields at all times and with your patients in areas outside of your area of expertise. I hope your eagerness to investigate the causes of rare or mysterious diseases will not preclude your involvement in efforts to end more commonplace, but equally challenging, equally devastating, and often entirely preventable diseases. I'm less concerned with what specialty you've chosen than how you intend to make use of it. What the old-time family doctor like my father knew and did is still true for what each and every doctor can do today. Each physician can and should make a difference both in the examining room and beyond. If you choose not to take up a cause, then I hope at least you will not be indifferent to or stand in the way of others who do. It's not the critic who counts, wrote Theodore Roosevelt, not the man who points out how the strong men stumble or when the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes up short again and again who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, and spends himself in a worthy cause. Godspeed to you, colleagues, doctors, teachers. Thank you, Dr. Blum. I'm pleased